we have seven protected classes as of right now in 2023. The first four were actually added um, in the 1960s during the civil rights movement. So that's race, color, national origin, and religion. Um, sexually added in the 1970s during the women's rights movement. And before it was added as a protected class, a landlord or housing provider could actually discriminate against selling property to women simply because they were women. Um, there would be a lot of myths around women. They provider in the United States could deny to rent, lease, or sell to someone with children. It was completely legal. Um, was huge in the housing market and in the rental market. And seeing this progression through the decades, we understand that fair housing law, it evolves. It constantly evolves as we learn more about discrimination trends and um, who And has its own protected classes. It's going to have their own protected classes. Single, married, divorced, cohabitation. Um, that cannot be a factor in housing transactions. Uh, income that is pretty big. Um, for example, if an individual is receiving a um, housing choice voucher or federal assistance, SSI, SSDI, um, TANF, VA disability, um, they cannot be discriminated against and the landlord can't say, well, I'm not accepting that income. You have to have a different kind of income. You have to have a W-2, you have to have a job. I'm not gonna accept. Um, And then actual identity, gender identity on any spectrum. Um, and Oregon actually had this before it became. Replaced to dwellings. So that magic word there, so dwellings, dwelling. Culture, so all transitionary housing as well. And then um, possibly motel rooms. So this is circumstantial. So, um, you know, when we had the massive amount of wildfires in 2020 and we had thousands of people that were displaced from their homes, when that happened, oftentimes while the insurance is being processed or while they're finding somewhere to live, they're being put up in motel rooms and they may be there for months at a time. Well, when that happens and they're living in that motel room and that is their domicile, that is a dwelling. So, who must comply? Um, real estate agents, mortgage lenders, insurers, neighbors, jurisdictions, advertising media, everybody in this room most likely is. Uh,
all consistent criteria consistent let's say that word <laughs> in logical order so from the time you got the application meaning if a landlord's waiting for their buddy to put in an application and they have 10 applications sitting on their desk that are totally belong to race, national origin, and familial status. So as far as protected class, disability is probably our highest um, inquiry. And then of that, about 30% roughly belongs to the remaining protected classes. Okay, so definition of disability. So the fair housing um, actually has a very broad definition of disability. So the definition is any physical or mental condition that substantially impairs a major life activity major life activity can be anything walking seeing hearing breathing um, thinking caring for oneself all of those are disabilities um, in fair housing and fair housing doesn't have the same requirements as for example the social security administration um, to be recognized as having a disability through SSI versus through fair housing, there is a significantly um, longer process. Through fair housing, disabilities can be, if you see someone with a service animal that lives in your complex and they're very obviously blind and you have known them for six months and you have seen their service animal and you've seen them, you don't need to then go ask them to verify their disability. That would be very very over the top and can also be discriminatory as well um, so disability also includes chronic medical conditions like ms um, cerebral palsy schizophrenia autism seizure disorder asthma ptsd um, add adhd depression and anxiety um, these are all disabilities and then so Regarding disability also, people with a history of drug or alcohol abuse also fall under the disability category under fair housing. However, there is a caveat. If someone is a former drug user and they are in treatment, they are clean, they are working with a program, they are protected under fair housing. However, if they are actively using illegal drugs, they are not protected under fair housing. They have to have a period of time a marker, a significant um, you know, program, something that they're going through to show that that past is behind them and that they are in an active recovery. Um, if they're, you know, if they're living in an apartment and they are about to get evicted and they want to do a reasonable accommodation and then during an inspection, it's found that they are still using drugs. Um, they are no longer protected under disability. And it includes a history of disability as well. Um, and then an assumption of having disability. So that goes with um, that previous scenario with someone who's very obviously has a disability. Um, you can take that as, I verify that I have seen this person with their service dog. I have seen this person and they, you know, appear to me to be disabled. So I can take, you know, this request. I can respect that. 
So reasonable accommodations and modifications. So this is getting into um, more of, we're gonna get into what each one is and also kind of the differences between them. So sometimes um, reasonable accommodations and modifications are needed to restore equal access of enjoyment of housing with someone living with a disability. So a landlord might need to add something, they might need to remove something, a barrier, make exception to a policy or procedure. Um, and these can be done by a reasonable modification and accommodation requests. So we'll start with modification. So thinking about the words modification and accommodation. So a modification is any physical change to the unit. You are modifying the unit. You are changing it in some way, shape, or form. You are possibly adding in um, a ramp. Maybe you are extending the doorways to make them larger so that they can have wheelchair access. Um, that's a modification installing shower bars um, safety extra safety features that need to be installed um, those are modifications so an accommodation is an exception to a policy rule or procedure so the easiest way to think about this is think of accommodation as more of an administrative side and a modification is more of a physical side so this can be something like an assistance animal that is a reasonable accommodation or say someone they there's only two disabled parking spaces in the entire complex, and there's at least four or five people fighting over them at any given time. If a reasonable accommodation is requested to add more parking spaces, that is completely reasonable because there is a need for it. So regarding accommodation and modification requests, so someone can request a reasonable accommodation or, or modification at any time, any time in the housing process. So this includes at application, during tenancy, even um, if the resident made the request um, after bringing the animal into the house. So one kind of specific scenario is um, if someone has an assistance animal and they are moving into an apartment complex and the apartment complex has a, um, a non-restrictive pet policy. They don't have um, any restrictions on the pet policy. They don't care. They say whatever. So you bring your pet in and you say, well, they have a non-restricted pet policy, so I'm just not going to say anything because, you know, I have a service animal. And then in six months, they change and they say, anybody that has a pet, we are now going to require pet rent. We're going to require $50 a month for pet rent. As soon as that happens, I can say, well, I have a service animal. I'm going to file a reasonable accommodation so that I don't have to pay the pet rent because my service animal is exempt from all fees regarding that animal to that apartment complex to the landlord to wherever you're um, living and that is um, completely um, legal and it is very it's something that we're actually seeing as a trend um, currently is um, there are apartment complexes there are properties that are allowing all animals no size weight restrictions but they're a blanket everybody has to pay $50 a month pet rent everybody doesn't matter bring all your pets but you have to pay a $50 pet rent well, if someone has a service animal and they don't know, and they just say, well, they're not gonna, they're not gonna harass me about it. They're not gonna be upset about it. So I'm just gonna pay the rent and I'm just gonna go about my business. Well, that $50 a month to someone who has a disability may make a serious difference. That's $600 a year. So that is something that, you know, as a housing provider, as an advocate, as a consumer, as someone in the community, um, it's our responsibility to let people know and to also um you know why we want to give this training because this is something that is happening it's happening out there every day and i can't say i'm too happy about it because i personally actually have a therapy dog um, she was trained back when i was in the military and i had an apartment complex that tried to deny me having her and i had to get a reasonable accommodation letter from my doctor i gave it to the apartment complex and we lived there for two years with no issues. So it really comes down to sometimes the landlord just wants verification. Hey, just give me something. Give me paperwork. Give me documentation. And oftentimes that's all it takes. So there's no limit to the number of requests someone can make. So if you want to file six different reasonable accommodations or modifications during your tenancy there, each one's for a different reason. Um, each one is going to also be looked at individually. So each one should be looked at in its own merit. So if I want to request, you know, regarding accessibility bars of the shower, and then 
well, I also need, you know, these, this doorway extended. I need the doorway widened. Those are two separate requests that need to be looked at on separate merits. It's best it's done in writing and it's best to always keep a copy of whatever you submit. But a verbal reason accommodation or reason modification request is, it should be allowed. Um, oftentimes there runs an issue with this because it's obviously comes down to a, you know, a they said, I said situation. So we always really recommend that they're done in writing. And then each request is evaluated on its own merits and looked at individually. And they have to be initiated by the person with the disability. So unless it's federally funded housing. So what this means is if there is a landlord and you know, there's a tenant on the second floor and the tenant was in a very bad car accident and now maybe they um, are paralyzed from the waist down and they can still get to their unit fine, there's an elevator, but if there's a fire, what if the elevator stops? What if it stops working? How does that person get out of the building? The landlord thinks about that and the landlord says, you know what, maybe we can just move them to the first floor. I'll go talk to them about it. Absolutely not okay. The request has to be made by the person with the disability. If they are completely fine with their accommodations and they don't want to change, then that is completely up to them. It's not the landlord's responsibility to approach the person and suggest what accommodations or modifications they may want. And then all residents should be able to meet the lease agreement. <laughs> yes. Yes, we will. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more. And then so for re reasonable combination requests at application, so they can help with disability related barriers to get into housing, they can be used to demonstrate what has shifted or what has changed in a person's life. Um, kind of going back to that someone who may have been a previous um, user of substances, if they can show that that is a their previous user, hey, I've here's my here's a letter from my sponsor, or here is, you know, my treatment um that is demonstrating what has changed about their situation and then the housing provider should then overlook that barrier if that person turns in an accommodation and they have perfectly valid reasons and say hey you know this is who i was this is my treatment program i am six months clean i have you know this rental history and i would like to live here housing providers should overlook that barrier because there's no reason for them to assume that that person has any other reason <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. I just got over COVID a couple weeks ago and I'm trying not to cough really, really hard. <laughs> no, I'm okay. I just do not want to cough into the microphone. <laughs> so a barrier is going to be what has changed. So if someone, you know, has, for example, maybe an arrest record that they can say, hey, I've been in this treatment program. I have done this. I've completed these classes. That has changed. That barrier no longer applies to me. And then verification. So verification is what comes last and it's what has to come before the request is submitted, right? So you have to have some kind of proof. You can't just write a letter to your landlord and say, blah, 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 blah. This is no, this no longer applies to me, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, anybody can say that, but maybe they have a letter from their sponsor. Maybe they have a certificate from the class that they took that has the date that they completed it. Um, that would be verification, but you, but if the landlord asks for verification, they need to provide it. Um, that is required, legally required. So for reasonable accommodation requests after receiving a termination or eviction notice, um, for example, if the notice was caused by a symptom, um, by a side effect of a disability, the person can request a reasonable accommodation to remedy the violation and stay in the housing. Um, example, this could be noise um, or harassment. Um, one example that we do see is um, persons that um, have hoarding disorder. Um, oftentimes the eviction notice will kind of be that, that push that says, okay, I need help. I need to do this. I have to be out of here in 14 days. And that eviction notice can actually be kind of the catalyst to get the person ready, I'm gonna have a reasonable accommodation. We're going to come up with a plan to clean. We're gonna come up with this plan. We're gonna present it to the landlord and we're gonna ask them to extend the lease by six months so that we can show them that we can get the apartment back to maintainable condition. 
So verification. So some examples from verification are a letter from a qualified individual, a certificate from a drug and alcohol program, um, and at application, documentation that shows um, a change in behavior that was related to a disability. So as far as a qualified individual that can provide verification, so this is a pretty common question we get. Um, verifiers must be a qualified individual who knows the person's situation well. It does not have to be a qualified professional. And we say this because you can have someone as a sponsor. Someone can be an AA and have a sponsor, and they could be their sponsor for two years, and that person could be with them by their side helping them get into treatment, helping them get into classes, and they know that person. They know that person intimately, they know their disability, and they can say, yes, this is, you know, they, this person has a service animal, the service animal assists them. Um, that is completely valid as a sponsor. Now, they're not a professional. They don't have a degree. They don't have maybe a certification. They're not a doctor. They're not an MD. They're not a therapist, but they are an individual who is qualified. So another example is a person with a disability has a poor rental history due to a medical issue that prevented them from working and all of their unpaid bills were sent to collections. Due to the injury, this person suffers from very high anxiety. And the verifier could be the person's pastor. Since the pastor was a supportive person during this injury process before and after, maybe the church assisted them, maybe they are using some of the church's programs and the pastor can verify. Um, the pastor is not what people would say is a professional, <laughs> a religious professional, I suppose, um, but still very well qualified. So let's just kind of go with the 50-50 here of who can provide verification. A doctor, obviously a nurse, okay. A counselor, absolutely. Psychologist, absolutely. Social worker, absolutely. Religious leader, absolutely. Sponsor, absolutely. Now, questionable friends. Co-workers, okay? Your grocery teller, your cousin, your parent, maybe an online predatory source, which um, Glenda's gonna go into specifics on later. So we're just gonna kind of move past that, but it's highlighted for a reason. So regarding verification, it does, does not have to disclose what the disability is or the physical benefits of the request. So this is very important because there are, there are times when someone will provide a reasonable accommodation request and they'll have a letter from a provider and the provider will just give them the very basic skeletal information that they need. And the landlord says, well, we need to know what the disability is. Well, we need to know for whatever reason they can come up with. They absolutely do not need to know. It is not their legal right to know. Absolutely not. It does have to state the request is necessary to restore equal access or enjoyment of housing. It does have to state that the request is connected to the disability. And the Fair Housing Council Oregon provides fillable forms. We have very basic forms um, that people can use, that um, advocates can use to help their clients. And they are very, um, they're accessibility friendly. Um, and they're very simplistic to where almost anybody can just take one and fill one out. Um, and they are on our website at fhco.org. And then, so all requests must be reasonable. What does that mean? What does a reasonable request even mean? Well, HUD defines what makes a request unreasonable. So unreasonable does not mean that landlords second guess the verification, but it has to do with the impact on the housing provider. Okay, so if it's too costly and it's an undue burden, unreasonable. If it is within, um, sorry, it's not within the job description of the housing provider. Okay, if it's unsafe for other residents or if it will cause damage to the property. Um, one kind of quick example is, for example, if someone is um, disabled and they have a dog and when they take the dog out to go to the bathroom they are physically unable to bend over and pick up after that dog they cannot then file a reasonable accommodation so that the maintenance staff has to go pick up it after their dog that is not in their job description that is not something that would be considered reasonable 
Now, reasonable accommodation requests during tenancy, so they can help someone stay in stable housing. For example, a reminder to pay rent on time. Maybe the landlord sends the person a physical letter or tapes something to their door five or six days before rent is due so that they have enough time to remember and process. Um, maybe it's a reserved parking space and someone just needs to be a little closer to their actual complex because parking is so limited that they have to park six buildings over. So they need a designated spot so that doesn't happen. Maybe they need a live-in caregiver or maybe they need an assistance animal. Okay, this is where I'm gonna take over. Is this thing even on? Hello, okay. So um, I'm gonna go back just a few things. I'm gonna make it, okay, I'm gonna make it clear when it comes to um, reasonable accommodation, it's always about disability, okay? Someone should not be asking for reasonable accommodation if there's not a disability connected to it, and it's got to make sense. I'll give you an example. I see an endocrinologist, and on one day when I went into her office for my uh, a visit for an appointment, on her counter, it literally, she had a sign there saying she would not write reasonable accommodation for assistance animals, and I was baffled. So I, of course, want to ask her why. Okay, so with that stated, she, lit, she did say, she goes, Glenda, I don't see people for mental health. And I don't see people for disability. I see people because they're endocrine system. And if they're having problems with, with, I don't know, just depression, anxiety, I'm not treating them for that. Therefore, I will not write them a reasonable accommodation. Made sense to me. Okay. And good on her. Okay. That gives, I mean, I think a lot of times, a, a lot of landlords think that doctors and therapists are just writing these reasonable accommodations for no reason. And just handing them to people like like candy like we do here okay by the way eat all the candy because if you don't she's going to or i'm going to and i don't want it <laughs> okay so with that stated we're going to move on and i am going to dive a little bit deeper into a firmly furthering fair housing it's not added to this training but because i, I talked to a few people earlier they're actually they get they have programs that are federally funded which changes the game for them so reasonable accommodation for assistance animals. A reasonable accommodation for an assistance animal can be submitted at any time. And Savannah already covered this, but I'm gonna reiterate that. Any reasonable accommodation can be, can, um, be submitted at any time. That means at application, it means after tenancy. Okay, that means after you've been accepted into, in, into the residence and now you're a tenant. And for assistance animals, it even means after you bring the animal into the unit without permission from the landlord you can still ask for reasonable accommodation. It also means that after receiving any kind of violation notice or termination notice, if it's going to cure the problem, you can't just ask for reasonable accommodation. Let's say you get a, verif uh, you get a, a violation notice for noise, and I'm gonna give you an example. Uh, PTSD, someone has night terrors. They wake up screaming in the middle of the night, wakes up their neighbors, neighbors are complaining about noise. The tenant gets a violation notice for noise. With that stated, then that tenant can turn around and say, you know what, I've been talking to my, my veterans counselor and that we've been kind of discussing getting a dog that's trained to wake me up before my night terror gets to the point where I'm screaming. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. They ask for a reasonable accommodation to have this animal. They get a verification letter from their VA counselor. Okay. At that point in time, that, that specific situation is going to remedy the problem. They can't just ask for an animal that's not going to remedy the problem, okay? It's very specific with that, especially when it comes to violation. Assistance animals um, can help in many, many ways. They can help with emotional support. Some of them are trained to do specific work. Some of them are trained to do, maybe detect low blood sugar. Maybe they can regulate someone's heart rate. They can help someone with autism, okay? They help many ways across the board. In fair housing, assistance animal is an umbrella term we use to cover trained service animals, emotional support animals, and companion animals. So you might hear a lot from landlords or other people, they say ESA or trained service dog or something. That in housing, that falls under the same umbrella. Veterans Administration, ADA law, Social Security Administration, Department of Human Services, they all have their own definition for disability. 
Okay, Savannah covered that earlier regard with the definition under fair housing law with disability is it's very broad and inclusive. Okay, so when someone's got a disability and they need an assistance animal, they may probably in housing they're going to qualify for that. Be aware that trained service dogs are the only animals allowed in public access areas. Okay, an emotional support animal is not allowed in the grocery store. An emotional support animal is not allowed in the, the theater, okay? But they are allowed in housing, and landlords should be honoring that. So policies, rules for, for um, policies and rules for assistance animals. It's okay for a landlord to have a policy that says assistance animals must be properly licensed and vaccinated if the local jurisdiction has an ordinance that says so. Something you need to be aware of the state of Oregon has a law that says all counties must have a law regarding vaccination and licensing for the for dogs and or cats, depending on what they want to do there. Okay, specifically dogs, though. If that county decides not to have that ordinance, they can pass it down to the local jurisdictions, the cities, and then those cities are responsible for making their own ordinance. In Umatilla County, they've done this. So every town in Umatilla County has its own ordinance pertaining to registration, licensing, and vaccination of, of any kind of animal, well, dogs specifically. Some have cats and dogs, some have dogs. So if the local jurisdiction has a policy saying that, then a landlord can have that on their application and or their contract, okay? If the local jurisdiction says, uh, we have a $25 lifetime fee to register animal, we don't care if it's vaccinated, the landlord cannot require the vaccination. And the reason why the landlord can ask for that is because on the application somewhere, it should state that the tenant must remain law abiding, not the application, I'm sorry, the, the, the contract, the rental contract. If on their rental contract, there's not a verbiage for that, they can't ask for this on an assistance animal addendum, okay? So be aware, if it's not stated on the rental contract that they must remain law abiding as a tenant, then they can't ask for licensing and verification. Because that's why they give that's why they're able to put that on an addendum. Spay or neutering. You see that all the time now. Landlords can ask in the pet policy, they can have that all day long. There is no laws pertaining to pet policies. They in a pet policy, they can say, every Friday you've got to dye your dog a different color. You'd have to do it. Okay. But when it comes to assistance animals, they can't require you to alter your animal or spend more money on your animal when it's the, when it's, it's it's because you have a disability okay would they tell somebody in a wheelchair they have to have their their wheelchair maintenance every month nope so therefore they cannot ask you to spend more money on your animal than required by law and there i can guarantee you if someone finds one please notify me there is not one ordinance out there at a local level that says dogs and or cats must be spayed or neutered they will give discounts for, for licensing if it's spay or neutered, but they don't require it. So when you see this, please, 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 if you're advocating on behalf of a tenant or an applicant, we'll get there, how to, how to advocate for that. If not, if you don't feel like you wanna advocate, contact the Fair Housing Council, we'll advocate on your behalf. Weight and breed restrictions. Weight and breed restrictions are, are great for pet policies, but they do not apply to assistance animals. Okay, I don't care if it's an elderly person living in a studio apartment and they have a Great Dane. They may use that Great Dane for stability so they can stand up and wash their dishes, um, do their laundry, move around the house safely, whatever it may be, okay? Um, landlords cannot have those types of restrictions for assistance animals. Deposits and pet rent. Savannah touched on this earlier, but one of the trends we're seeing right now in Oregon, especially in the mid Willamette Valley, is landlords are saying we're going to honor every every animal, Let's bring them in, we don't even care. But then they charge everybody twenty five dollars a month for pet rent. So people who got disabilities don't think they have an option. This is the deal: that animal is a pet until a reasonable accommodation is requested and verification is provided. Okay, so if you're working with somebody or you have a tenant who has an animal and that animal's an assistance animal, please urge them to still file that reasonable accommodation with a, with a, a landlord who's got, a, um, who honors all animals. 
because that landlord could potentially get money from them every month and they don't have to pay it if it's a reasonable accommodation for an assistance animal. Online predatory verification sources are absolutely not okay. How many people here think those are okay? How many people have heard, go online and purchase a verification certificate or get my animal certified online? I'm so glad no one's raising their hands. Okay, so with that stated, um, HUD has made it very clear. HUD is the agency that provides guidance for assistance animals, for fair house, the Fair Housing Act, for you name it, fair housing, they're the ones that provide guidance for it. But when it comes to assistance animals, they've made it very clear that online resources are not adequate. And the reasons why they're not adequate is there's no clear professional relationship with the individual online who's providing this verification and the person needing the verification. They're ask, asking to be paid for that. I mean, if you have a doctor or a therapist or a sponsor or someone you're working with on a regular basis who understands your circumstances, more than likely they're not going to pay you for that. You don't have to pay them for that verification, okay? Um, and they shouldn't be charging you for that verification. If you are seeing a doctor on a regular basis or a tenant is seeing a doctor on a regular basis and they call their clinic and say, hey, I need a, a reasonable accommodation for my dog, they should not require an appointment if you've been going to that person for any length of time. They should just email it over to you or have you pick it up at their office or mail it to you, whatever it is that you agree upon. So again, online predatory verification. You also need to be aware that some online sources, I did this to see how easy it was and I don't need a reasonable accommodation for an assistance animal, okay? Went online, put my information in there, paid $125, they set me up with a local provider who called me on the phone and spoke to me for 45 minutes. I got an email from this provider and that the verification was crazy. It was a page long, which it should never be. They literally stated, I met with you, I diagnosed you, here is your diagnosis. They put it in a letter, a verification letter, okay? And then I told them I didn't have an animal yet, so they made, they made the verbiage match that, but I've seen ones where they state Jane Doe has got a full size poodle who will who's friendly and they make all these statements about the animal they've never even met. Okay, and somewhere in the meat and potatoes of that letter it's very um, intimidating for landlords if your landlord does not accept this verification, you must report them to HUD here's the contact for HUD. Doctors don't do that. Verification letters don't do that. Okay, so just know those verification letters are not okay. If you're working with someone and they, and they go online to, or they want to go online, to tour them that to tour them from doing that, landlords do not accept those those verification letters. So um, a reason why someone might need more than one animal. In this situation, it's an individual who's got PTSD, they have night terrors, and their dog works a lot at night. Dog's up a lot, dog doesn't get a lot of sleep at night, so it tends to nap and sleep during the day. Well, because of their disability, they have a lot of anxiety and depression that goes along with that, and they may need another animal during the day to provide emotional support. So in this case, it's a very good example when two animals might be needed, okay? There's gotta be a clear reason when someone's asking for multiple animals, what those animals do. A tenant or applicant cannot ask for a reasonable accommodation to have three cats if there's no clear reason why three cats are needed. They can ask, but the landlord has every right to deny two of those cats. Okay. I'll give you an example when three cats might be needed. So you have an idea of what that looks like if you're advocating on behalf of someone. Let's say it's an individual living by themselves and they ask for a reasonable accommodation for three cats. And the landlord's like, ugh, I need some more information. I need more verification. This is not clear enough for me to see, to make a determination if, if three cats are needed. So she, the, the, the person living by themselves is able to give verification. One of the verifications states that her doctor's requiring her to get more exercise due to her disability to help her get healthier. Well, what if her cats will actually walk on a leash and two of the cats will not, okay? She also suffers from some kind of social anxiety, very difficult for her to go outside. And the cat being with her helps her with that, okay? 
she, because of her disability also, she has a hard time getting to sleep at night. One of her cats will actually sleep with her whereas the other one will not. Not the other two doesn't want anything to do with her at nighttime. And one of them actually detects low blood sugar. Okay, very good examples of why three cats might be needed. But unless those examples can be given, just know if you're working with an individual who, need, who wants to keep their cats, they need to be able to express why. They can't just go, my cat needs an assistance animal. They would die without each other. Okay, that doesn't work, it's not good enough. So um, there's, gotta be a meta, there's gotta be a reason why, uh, a benefit to the tenant. Yes. Okay, you know what? We're going to put you on speaker because we have people that are online and they want to hear your question. My question is, I am wondering how the person would go about demonstrating that the how they need more than one animal. Okay, so I'll explain. I'll go back to the three cat situation. Okay, doctor has been working with this individual for a long time. Okay, this person's got lots of dis lots of medical issues. Okay, and lots of mental health issues. They may even have a doctor and a mental health professional, might have both, but we'll just say they, they work with their doctor, okay? The doctor understands their need, and the doctor did say, you know, if you got some exercise, you would probably feel a lot better. It would help your condition. And, the and then the tenant, as they're talking to their doctor, might go, doc, you know how I am. I can't even go to the store. I have to have my kids do my shopping for me. I can't leave my apartment. Coming here is a big deal. It takes me all morning to like get ready and, get out the door and I'm just a cold sweat the whole time. So the doctor in the verification would literally write something like one animal is needed because it does walk on a leash and it helps her get exercise. Due to her disability, she's unable to be in public spaces and causes a lot of anxiety, whatever, whatever. Um, they might also say that she has a hard time with sleep deprivation. Okay, they're not giving the disability out. They're giving a little bit more information on why what those animals do. One animal is able to sleep with her and provide her with that comfort at nighttime to get to, bed, to, get to sleep. And she's got an animal that detects low blood sugar. That makes sense? It really needs to come back to the qualified individual. And when you're dealing with a situation like that, unfortunately, it's probably gonna be a doctor or a therapist because it's multiple animals. It's not like, don't get me wrong, the sponsor could probably also write that letter, but for details in regards to all this stuff, it might be best if it came from a doctor. I'm not saying it has to, or don't, don't, don't take me on that one, but in certain circumstances, it might be best that the doctor is the one writing it. So can any kind of animal be an assistance animal? Well, Hud's made it clear it's got to be a common household animal. Dogs, cats, hamsters, birds, fox turtles, goldfish, okay? Um, exotic animals and or uh, unique animals. Why does it do that? What are you doing back there, man? He's not even paying attention. You're good. You're not doing anything. Anyway, <laughs> if someone is a unique animal, there's got to be a purpose for that. It's got to be that, that unique animal is going to perform a function that a, a trained dog cannot do. This picture here is a Chapkin monkey whose owner is a quadriplegic and it, the person does have a living care provider or care, multiple care providers that come in and take care of that individual. But this monkey alleviates some of the work they have to do. This monkey can turn light switches on and off. It can bring, it can go grab things and bring them back. It can open a bottle of water, put a straw in it, put it in the holder. Okay, it can do job, do, do specific work that dogs cannot be trained to do. Okay, so in those cases, landlords would have to honor a unique animal. Breed restrictions. So remember I said earlier, weight and breed shouldn't be an issue when it comes to assistance animals. Insurance companies kind of muck that up a little bit, okay? However, Savannah said earlier that insurance companies gotta follow fair housing law, right, when it comes to housing. So if a landlord has got an insurance policy for their property that they're renting out, and the insurer says, we do not allow aggressive breeds on the property, Otherwise, we will not insure the property. Then there's a, kind of a catch-22 there. Well, what about assistance animals? Landlords then have to show, if they're gonna use the excuse, my insurance company doesn't allow aggressive breeds, and here's the list of aggressive breeds, and you have one, I'm not gonna you know, accept it. 
the housing providers got a show where they've sent that reasonable accommodation to the insurance company and they need to let them know under fair housing law i'm obligated to accept this animal okay and so are you if the insurance company's playing hardball and they go no we're not doing it then the landlord's got to show where they try to find another insurance company okay now if they've done their due diligence and did both of those things there that i have on the on the screen and they can show that the other insurance companies want to charge them more money and they've already spent too much time on this and they're about ready to pull their hair out they might be able to deny due to too costly in an undue burden okay so be aware of that but they would need to be able to prove they've done this they can also call the fair housing council of oregon and our enforcement team and advocate on their behalf just so you know that so what you um inquiries if any may a housing provider make of a current or potential resident regarding the existence of a disability when the applicant or tenant have not asked for an accommodation. This is where I'm gonna start talking about a firmly furthering for housing really quick. Under normal circumstances, a landlord, a private market landlord that includes section eight landlords also, should never be inquiring about any type of disability on an application. Okay, ever, ever, ever. If it's a housing provider who's federally funded, tax credit housing, housing authority, senior disabled housing, farm worker housing, home programs. I mean, there's a list and list. There's a, a list of them. Okay, they have a different obligation than a private market landlord. They have this thing called a firmly furthering for housing (AFFH). They have a higher responsibility to work with tenants on all levels, and that even includes disability they can get away with asking on their application, do you need a reasonable accommodation due to a disability? They can get away with that, but a private market landlord should not be asking that at all, okay? Um, federally funded housing providers, when they give a, a notice of violation, should also be asking, do you need a reasonable accommodation? And that can either be on, listed on, you know, written on the notice itself, the violation notice itself. I know some providers, actually have caseworkers that work with them and they will go ask the tenant after getting a notice of, of a, a violation if they need a reasonable accommodation if it can cure the problem so just know that federally funded housing providers work in a different realm than private market landlords do yes oh wait hang on. you say should be asking if they need a, re a reasonable accommodation on a violation they must, they must. okay mm -hmm. we'll change it to must yeah so federally funded housing providers must uh a firmly further for housing by asking people if they need a reasonable accommodation to cure violations they must work with with tenants longer trying to accommodate their reasonable accommodations even if they can't accommodate what they're asking for okay um their law their rules and policies should be less stringent i mean there's a whole gamut of things that people that's a whole training in itself okay just so you know that so i'm gonna touch on it but do you understand what i'm saying and so Mel's not here, but if she was, I would introduce you right now, okay? Um, contact Mel and tell her you need a, 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 a training for a firmly furthering for housing. That's what you need. Okay, so let's move on with this. Um, under Fair Housing um, Act, it's usually unlawful, usually, and I say usually because there's those landlords that are federally funded, okay? Um, unlawful for a housing provider to ask if an applicant for a dwelling has a um, has a disability, or if a person intending to reside in the dwelling or anyone associated with the applicant has a disability. They should never be asking that ever on an application. How many of you have seen that kind of verbiage on applications before? Marley has. Ask about the nature or severity of a person's disability. Seen that before in an application? Okay. Do you think it's okay for a landlord to ask about someone's wheelchair? Is it? Does it work well? How often do they have to replace it? Is it gonna cause damage to the carpet? Probably not, right? What about someone's modified bathroom? Do you really need the grab bars? Okay, how many do you really need? Can I put one in? Is that okay? Are you gonna need me to, to modify other stuff for you? All right, landlords should not be asking those questions. And why is that? Somewhere back in this presentation, it stated that um, uh, it was in red. Uh, it stated that reasonable accommodation, um, well, maybe it didn't. I don't think we're there yet. I'm not gonna blow that one yet. I'll wait, I won't say that yet. 
Maybe someone's walking with a limp or a walker and their landlord walks out there, this is the private market landlord, and says, hey, do you, you, know, do you need a, a reasonable accommodation? Do you need a parking spot? Remember that thing about history? She talked about history or um, uh, assumption of disability. Okay, just because someone's walking with a limp doesn't mean that they're chronically disabled or they're not, you know. Maybe they'll take offense to that. Maybe they, that's the last thing they want is a, a parking spot because they're pissed off that they have to use the walker. Okay, and now you've even made them more mad. So landlords should not be asking that kind of stuff. And they sure as heck shouldn't be asking anything on their application about an assistance animal. Yes. Oh, hang on. We got people online that want to hear your voice. I came here um, specifically for an answer. And I know that you're legally you're not able to and and ask a I, question just don't ask specific oh, ask hypothetical um there's a um where i am now i'm a property manager mm -hmm. there and there's a there's an animal service animal that right? yes okay. and and um he's a sweet animal sweet you know mm -hmm. but the barking uh, so the resident and I come, we came to the conclusion that we said, well, well, when he comes down the lobby out of the elevator, we'll have him with a muzzle because it's, he's big, but he's not going to do anything. He just likes to bark. I don't know why, but in the unit at night, continuous barking and I've had complaints and I, I'm just like at a hypothetically at a standstill. Sure. Like I totally understand where hypothetically that might be a problem. Okay, so with that stated, what does your rental contract say? Do you, have a, do you have an assistance animal addendum that you would add to your rental contract? Uh, yeah. Is there a noise thing in there? Um, Ooh. Okay, I'm going to help you with this. So landlords should have an assistance animal addendum if they have assist if they're you know obviously honoring assistance animals. Okay. I'm gonna, it's gonna plug this and not because I get paid, but I probably should because I plug it so much. <sighs> Multifamily Northwest has got great forms online. You will have to pay for them like $5 or something like that. They have an assistance animal addendum. That's amazing. It covers everything a landlord should be covering in an addendum for an assistance animal. If an animal is violating the rental contract, whether by noise, digging holes, being aggressive, the owner's not picking up after the animal. Hang on. They want to hear your voice too. No. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. They want to. <laughs> <laughs> what was the name of the? Multifamily Northwest. Multifamily Northwest. They're located here in Portland or near Portland. Taggart, yeah, something like that. Yeah. They have a great forms page. Every, any form a landlord would ever want is on that page. And they have um, attorneys vet those those um, forms and the Fair Housing Council of Oregon. I'm assuming that the task force does. I mean, yes, no. Okay, got it. Yeah, person in red, lady in red. I can't sing, but I'm gonna sing it anyway. I know that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm wondering, kind of as a takeoff of his question, mm -hmm. can you do this after the fact? What do you mean? Like, can you have an addendum after if you don't give it at the time of lease signing? For instance, like now, mm -hmm. can he do this? And if he did, he'd have to do it to every single animal in the building, mm -hmm. correct? Okay. So when you're changing your rental contract, that's a landlord tenant um, question, but I know a little bit about it. So I'm not an attorney. I didn't play one on TV. <laughs> I can't give legal advice, but I can give information. So with that stated, if you're gonna change your rental contract, there is a law out there that you have to give proper notice. So I would just suggest you look at that law under ORS 90, okay, of the landlord tenant laws in Oregon. It will tell you how much notice you must give a, a tenant before you change their rental contract on them. And then they have to sign it. You both have got to sign it. They have to agree to it. Otherwise, if you're in lease, they can tell you to pound sand. And they're not going to sign any lease with you until their lease is up. That makes sense? Okay. You're adding to the, an addendum is changing the contract. You are adding to the contract. Yeah, so people online, what she's saying, she was questioning, like, she didn't think they were changing the, an addendum changes the contract. You're adding to it. So anytime you're adding or changing the contract, 
there is a law out there that says how much notice you must give those those tenants to do that. All right. You. You're welcome. So what does a reasonable accommodation request for an assistance animal look like? Well, tenants responsibility always. And we're not talking to you federally funded folks. I'm looking at my time. I got 15 minutes. Okay, so we're going to just cruise through this. Okay, so tenants responsibility always to ask for the reasonable accommodation unless federally funded housing. Okay, so a landlord should never put on their application. Do you have an assistance animal? Mm -mm. It's the tenants responsibility to ask for that reasonable accommodation. That landlord should not be asking anything about disability on their on their application and or well, their application. Okay, they can put anything they want to in their contract if the tenant signs it. Reasonable accommodation requests must demonstrate the need for the assistance animal. We talked about that. There must be a clear nexus or connection between the disability and the duties of the animal. We talked about that. And the tenant or assistance animal must still be able to adhere to the rental contract. They're barking, digging holes, being aggressive. You handle it every time like a violation. I know it sounds terrible, but as a landlord, your job is to hold people accountable and be a good landlord. The moment you start being willy nilly with the rules is the point someone says, you're showing favoritism and why are you showing favoritism? Is it because of my race, my color, my gender, my national origin, my religion? Why are you doing this to me and not to them? Okay, so I suggest always best practice, you stick to your rental contract. If a tenant violates that rental contract, you handle it like a violation. An example for a reasonable accommodation. I'll just read it really quick. Dear Larry Landlord, as defined by the Fair Housing Act, I am a person living with a disability. I'm going to sit down. In accordance with the Fair Housing Act, I'm asking for reasonable accommodation to have my assistance animal live with me. This request is necessary for me as a person with a disability to have reasonable access to my housing. With this request, I have included a letter from my counselor, and that could be anything. I included a verification certificate from my drug and alcohol program. I included a verification letter from my, there I go again, um, pastor, preacher, whoever, okay? Doesn't like that. The letter ver um, verifies I meet the definition of disability of the Fair Housing Act and that my assistance animal is needed so I have reasonable enjoyment of my housing. Please respond within one week of receiving this request. Thank you for your time and consideration. Happy tenant. And they date it. It's important there's a date on that because they're asking for a response within a certain amount of time. Okay, super important. It's important they keep a copy of this. It's important that they document, 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 and keep any, if they give anything to their landlord, they must be able to retain a copy of it. So what information can a landlord require on verification letter? Best practice would say, this is, this is HUD's guidance, by the way, okay? A landlord can say, your verification letter must show the patient's name, whether the healthcare professional has a professional relationship with the patient, client involving the, the provision of healthcare or disability related services. This comes directly out of the guidance HUD gives for assistance animals, okay? They make this, this whole thing, they, they say healthcare professional here, but in their guidance, they also state that other people can provide verification that aren't health healthcare professionals. Okay, just be aware of that. I wanna clear that up. Um, what type of animal for which the reasonable accommodation is sought? Literally, if the person hasn't got the animal yet, they need to state that. But if they know the person already has the animal, they should be stating what the animal is, to their best description. You know, a 20 pound, whatever type of dog, brown and white dog or something. What information can a landlord require Again, there's more information, HUD states. It is recommended that the person seeking a reasonable accommodation for a support animal ask that the provider provide information in the, to, the, to the following. Whether the patient has a physical or mental impairment. Whether the patient's um, impairment substantially limit at least one major life activity or both, or, or major, major bodily function. Whether the patient needs the animal or animals because the animal does work, provides assistance, performs at least one task that benefits the patient um, of their disability. Or the animal provides therapeutic emotional support to alleviate a symptom or effect of the disability and not merely as a pet. Okay, so this is HUD's guidance in regards to what these reasonable accommodations need to cover. It doesn't have to have that, that specific lingo. So I'm gonna give you an example of what one might look like that's appropriate, okay? 
So dear Larry Landlord, there's a date on it. Happy Tenant is my client and I've been un, it has been under my care since 4-1-2023. There's definitely a relationship there, okay? It wasn't like she met with them one, no, yesterday for 45 minutes, all right? I'm familiar with her disability related limitations regarding her mental health, stating she's got a mental health condition and this doctor's familiar with that, the situation, okay? She meets the definition of disability under the Fair Housing Act. That doctor should not be telling you what the diagnosis is, okay, at all. Unless you want multiple animals, then they might have to dig a little bit deeper, but then they have to explain what each animal does then, okay? It is necessary that my client obtain an emotional support animal, they don't have one already, okay, to alleviate her disability-related symptoms, which will allow her to improve her emotional health and psychological function. This is necessary for equal access and enjoyment of her housing. Sincerely, it's got the concerned counselor's signature, their licensing number, their contact information. Landlords have every right to verify this, this person, this counselor wrote this letter. They can do that, okay? So they need to be able to contact the counselor. If they try to make contact with the counselor and the counselor never to return their phone calls, won't respond to an email, maybe the landlord goes to their address and, and then no one's there. At some point in time, the landlord can deny the reasonable accommodation if they are unable to verify, if that's their standard policy. If they're not doing that for every tenant, that, that's problematic. Every tenant who's needing a reasonable accommodation for an assistance animal. Yeah. Um, they're, they should know that they're not allowed to discuss the person's disability. So that would be fraudulent. Well, no, no, it's not. They're not giving out the diagnosis. They can't give diagnosis, okay. but they can give reasonable accommodation. And most doctors know this. We do come across some therapists once in a while, and I don't know why. I think it's down in the Southern Oregon area. They're like, oh, we're not doing this. Okay. Um, and you can't force them to. I'll just say that. You can't force them to. If someone's dealing with a therapist or a doctor who's unwilling to write their verification for them, then they may want to see if there's someone else in their life that's able to do that. That's the best thing I can see. Yeah, they know that there's HIPAA laws, so they can give this information. But if the doc, if the, if the landlord were to call to verify, all they're verifying is, did you write this letter? Okay, I'm not verifying. If I were to, the landlord calling, what, what, you know, I'm not asking. Well, they probably would, but they can't. The doctor's not going to get the information. What's the disability? They can't ask that question. Okay. So red flags. Let's talk about what some red flags are. These are actually happening in Oregon right now, believe it or not. Okay, on the application, um, does it ask if the applicant has a service or an ESA animal? They cannot ask that question in the application. It's a disability related question. They can't ask it. They don't ask if the living care provider, if they have a living care provider or if they have a you know, wheelchair. They don't ask any of those questions because it's related to disability. Same, same thing with assistance animals. Um, does the applicant uh, application state if questions are not answered or if it is later found the questions are not answered correctly or honestly, the application can be denied. That's fine and dandy for the rest of the questions, but when you're asking questions about disability, the person may not want to answer that. They don't have to by law. Okay. Yeah. So we work for an organization and we have a bridge shelter. Um, are we allowed to ask for these things as well? Not during your application process. Oh no, Where do, who do you work for again? I'm joking, I don't need to know, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, when it comes to, okay, so if you are dwelling, you fall under fair housing law, you can't ask questions on your application process that would violate fair housing law, okay? And this thing, I think it's this, I think the battery's going dead. Okay, does the applicate, yeah, we're gonna just turn this thing off. And we're just gonna go up here. Okay. Um, does the application state you must have your current medical provider verify you have a disability? Again, it could be your therapist. It could be the sponsor. It could be the pastor or priest or whoever. It doesn't have to be the medical provider. Does the application um, or the policy state failure to disclose pets, service assistance animals is a reason for denial? That would violate fair housing law. The pets are okay, they can deny that. I mean, they can do whatever they want to with pets, but when it comes to assistance animals, they can't say, if you fail to tell us an application, you have an assistance animal, we're gonna deny your application. They cannot say that. 
Health providers require applicant to complete an animal application. How many people have seen animal applications? Okay, these applications are crazy, all right? They are literally asking for both assistance animals and pets. Well, I'll give you some examples. Has your dog ever bit anyone? Has your dog taken obedience classes? May we visit you and your animal after you move in to see how well the animal has adjusted? What a bad idea that is. What if it's someone living with, maybe they're, they're a victim of domestic violence. They fled their abuser with their dog. Their dog also was a victim of domestic violence. Live that with them, okay? Their dog doesn't like men with beards. So sorry, man, okay? With that stated, the maintenance man shows up with a beard to meet the animal and the dog loses itself all over the place. He's just angry, okay? That's a bad, bad policy. No one has to meet the animal or the assistance animal to, to prove it, okay? It's not a good policy, they shouldn't have it. Does your animal have a medical or behavioral problem? Maybe if you send a guy over with a beard. How much time does your dog spend alone? Really? There are people who still need assistance animals who have function, okay? They, they still go to work. Their dog might be in a kennel in their home. Good part of the day, it might happen. Maybe their dog's used to it and doesn't mind, okay? It, it is what it is. The, the landlord doesn't get to dictate how you care for your animal or how long it's left alone. Now, the, the landlord can say, if they do an inspection and they find dog feces everywhere, the curtains are tore up, the walls are half chewed apart, that's different. That's damaged the property, they're violent in the rental contract, okay? But when the animal's not doing that destructive damage, the, the landlord should not be consider, uh, concerned with that. How often do you treat your animal for fleas and ticks? That would be the last day of never. I've never done that. Maybe I would if my dog got fleas. I don't know. Requires this as an animal to be spay or neutered. We talked about that earlier. They can't require that. Requires vaccinations that are not required by the local jurisdiction. Oh my gosh, I got three minutes. We're going to do this. Okay. Um, local jurisdictions can only require what, I mean, your land can only require what your local jurisdiction requires. If it's rabies, it's rabies. If there's no parvo in that requirement, in that ordinance, they can't require parvo. Okay. Requires a letter from the vet certifying the animal is healthy and is up to date on, on vaccinations. Really? Okay. Would you ask someone about their living care provider? As a landlord, would you say, hey, I need a letter from the your living care provider's doctor saying that they're healthy and they're up to doing the job? No, you wouldn't do that. You can't do it for assistance animals. Wants to meet and approve the animal before give, giving permission for the animal. We talked about that one. Bad idea. Requires this assistance animal to be insured. Again, you can't require insurance for an assistance animal. You can for a pet all day long. Remember, pets, you can dye them every Friday. Purple, blue, pink, it doesn't matter, okay? The fact is you can't have the same rules for pets as you do assistance animals. Uh, more red flags. Be aware of policies that allow all animals, specifically if landlord requires that all animal owners pay a monthly pet rent. Remember that whole thing about animals being allowed across the board, but yet now the landlord's charging everybody with an animal $25 a month. Your assistance animal is going to be a pet until they ask, so that person asks for a reasonable accommodation. Okay, so if you have a landlord who's allowing animals across the board, it's important if you're working with someone that they, you remind them to, to ask for reasonable accommodation if they have an assistance animal. And um, we talked about that. Review local um, county and city ordinances pertaining to registration and vaccination. Often house providers do not know the local ordinances and will have criteria on their applications or policies that are not legal regarding assistance animals. We, we spoke about that also. Um, How many of you guys work across the board in different jurisdictions, different counties? Okay, I would urge you to look at the county policy. If the county doesn't have a policy regarding licensing and vaccination, you go to each local um, jurisdiction, your city governments and see what their policies are. Your documents will have to meet what, what those local jurisdictions policies are regarding that type of stuff. Pay close attention to wording on rental applications, housing provider policies and housing provider body language and, and language itself and demeanor after someone says they want a reasonable accommodation for an assistance animal. That could be both verbal or in writing. So that landlord might change a little bit once they hear that. You can also be what they call a soft cop. I don't know if it's the best term, but we use it. 
someone who can say, hey, landlord, do you realize you're violating fair housing law? Here's a landlord booklet about fair housing law. Please review it, but I'm just letting you know what you're doing right now. It's not, it's not, it's, you're gonna get in trouble. And I'm just worried about you. Um, educate the people you provide services to about their rights under fair housing law. It's probably the best way to do it. And contact the Fair Housing Council of Oregon um, if you have any questions or you need support of any kind. We have plenty of people who work across the state. Matter of fact, Savannah State, you know, North Coast, Eastern Oregon. We got two wonderful people back here, Emily and um, Marley. Uh, we have Central Oregon and Midwell Lamont in Salem. Um, you can contact us or get information on our website at www.fhco.org. If you want to report housing discrimination or urge or someone you're working with to report housing discrimination, on our website at the very top of the screen, in a red box, it says report housing discrimination. Just so you know, our website's kind of messed up right now. Things aren't working on it. We don't know why. But they can, they can click on that. They can, there's an area there for both advocates and tenants themselves to put information about housing discrimination. Um, or they can call the landlord hotline if, or send the landlords my direction and I'll, I'll, I'll work with them. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question about fair housing specifically to assistance animals. Does that apply to adult foster care homes? Because I have had residents trying to move into them that are like, no, I, I need to bring my cat. And the owners of the foster care are saying, no, you can't have your cat, but it's an assistance animal. And the case manager is not advocating for them. So I will do that on their behalf. <laughs> okay, so dwellings. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover a little bit more on dwellings. Dorm rooms are a dwelling under fair housing law. Any facility a senior person or elderly person would live in nursing home, adult foster home, care facility, they're all protected under fair housing law. Um, transitional housing programs, some treatment programs, depending on why and how long they're there. Um, there's additional caveats to all of that, but yes, any place a senior lives is regarding care facility, it does apply. <laughs> That's a different issue. Anybody have any questions? Yes. So we're a, an emergency shelter, so I'm assuming that's going to still fall under dwelling. Okay, depending. There's questions now. So how long do people get to stay? Sleep violence. I get it. So 30 to 90 days, maybe. Okay, 180, two date years. Okay, yeah, you guys fall under fair housing law. Have you guys had a shelter training before? You have. Okay. Assistance animals, you do have to allow. You can have specific rules like if someone says i'm allergic to cats i can't be around cats as their eyes are pussing and swelling out to here you can require that people keep their cats in their room in like a kennel if the cats make a noise during the day meowing and carrying on you can have noise i mean it, it same rules a landlord would have you can have okay follow-up question okay uh-huh So this is the deal. You're gonna to wanna to reword that. You get federal funding. Okay, you're good. Just say, ask them if they need a reasonable accommodation. That's all you gotta say. Yep, okay. All right, we're done. I think we're past time. Our gracious IT guy back there has been amazing. He's awesome, by the way. All the hard work you put into this. Yeah, thank you. All right.